1817, Beethoven is 46, he's famous, his music is played at home and at abroad, and he needs indications for conductors and performers in the other parts of the world to play and to perform his music. Suddenly he has this device which allows him to be the first composer to indicate exactly how fast and how slow his pieces should be performed. The metronome marks will follow soon. Do not fail to wait for them. In our century, things of this kind are certainly needed. Performers must now obey the ideas of the unfettered genius. The last decade of his life was so painful on so many levels. I mean, besides losing his hearing, he was embroiled in this lengthy court battle to uh, take custody of his nephew. He was starving, I think, for, for connection, you know, personal connection, physical connection with other human beings. We might see this also as the attempt of an aging composer to keep control of things. Control of his music with the device of the metronome, control of his financial situation, because Beethoven couldn't get any fees anymore as a performer. Control of his personal life. I think it's the beginning of this incredibly rich, internal, imaginative life, so that he starts hearing in ways that we can't imagine. Forget the world, okay, I can't hear that. Now, I'm gonna hear I'm going to hear music from heaven. I'm going to hear music from hell. I'm going to hear music that no one else can hear. And then he shares that with us. And this is the revolution for me. Beethoven changes the course of music for all times. This concert in December 1813 is one of the big society events of contemporary Vienna. First performance of the Seventh Symphony. After four years without the new symphony, this is the time where the people expecting the utmost of this great composer. This concert of December 8, 1813, remember, is a benefit for soldiers wounded in battle. And the mood of Vienna and, and Europe at this point is really kind of exultant because Napoleon is going down. It's clear that he's near the end. And there's a kind of celebratory quality to the Seventh Symphony that absolutely plays into the spirit of the time. In that same concert was the premiere of Wellington's Victory, which is cashing in on the spirit of the time. <laughs> the, probably the most commercial thing he ever wrote, celebrating victory in the Napoleonic Wars over Napoleon. I always felt that Beethoven, at the end of that concert, he made a lot of money, pocketed the money with a kind of grin about how he had this marvelous success with a bad piece and a really nice success with a good piece. <laughs> This is the moment just after Wellington's victory has become an international hit and 
turned Beethoven into not just a well-regarded composer, but a local celebrity. This is Beethoven's most shining moment in public. Amid all of the euphoria, we see that in tandem with his deafness on the one hand, his increasing isolation, that this really just uh, constricts his world even more. He goes more inside of himself. Beethoven really experiences two episodes of acute depression during his lifetime. Clearly, around the time of the Heiligenstadt Testament, he suffered a major depressive crisis. And then again in the 1810s, as his, the, the extent of his hearing loss and the finality of it begins to sink in, he realizes now that he, he may be becoming completely deaf. What these episodes have in common is they shake his sense of who he is as a musician. Can I keep doing this? This is when he rewrites Fidelio and uh, elaborates even further on that dungeon scene and, and, and uh, makes it even more expressive and intense than it was before. The beginning of the second act, the, the scene opens on the character of Floriston, uh, deep underground in a dungeon in the dark. His very first words, he says, Gott, wer dunkel hier, how, how dark it is here. But then he goes on to, to express the sense that in the springtime of his life, at a time when he should have been able to expect happiness and fulfillment, everything has been taken away from him. He is set alone, he is in solitary confinement. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that Florestan, in the dungeon, in solitary confinement, lamenting his isolation, his, his, his failure to, to be able to realize the dreams that he had as a young man, uh, this is perhaps the most autobiographical moment in all of Beethoven's music. Beethoven is 44. He's aware of his faculties going, his most important faculty of hearing. And the more he loses control of that, the more he tries to gain control of anything else he can get his hands on. And of course, the first thing is his family. As the head of a family, you never lose that sense of responsibility and it continues. So Beethoven has is well established in Vienna now. Both of his brothers uh, are living in the vicinity. He meddles in Johann's relationships because he wants to advise him who, who he should marry. Karl has helped him with getting his music out as well with his publications and Beethoven is paying his, his medical costs. So he's kind of lauding it in a way.
In early November 1815, Beethoven learns that his brother Carl is dying of tuberculosis, which is the choking, bleeding horror that they watched their mother die from. He rushes to Carl's bedside, but he is already obsessed with the idea that he must get guardianship and complete control of their son, Carl. Beethoven believes the mother, Johanna, is absolute evil. He has to get Carl away from her because she will corrupt him. When you read the documents of all this story, he's not a really nice guy. And he uses a lot of different names for the mother. The most uh, used is uh, Queen of the Night. So he never names her with her name, but uh, gives her nicknames, um, and most of them are rather ugly ones. Last night, that Queen of the Night was at the artist's ball until 3 a.m., exposing not only her mental, but also her bodily nakedness. It was whispered that she was willing to sell herself for 20 golden. Oh, horrible. Oh, horrible. It had something to do with power and control. I don't like this wife, and she's not able to raise a child. But Beethoven wasn't much more able to raise a child, of course. In his opinion, he's the only one. He's always the only one. It's not very nice, this story. Beethoven devotes more energy than one might reasonably expect to the attempt to uh, uh, gain custody of Carl. I suspect that what is going on during this time is that Beethoven is seeking to repeat the pattern that played out in his own family as a child. His father placed uh, a great deal of expectation on Ludwig to be essentially a second Mozart, and uh, Beethoven is perhaps hoping that Carl can do the same thing. You regard Carl as your own child. He'd no gossip, no pettiness in comparison with this sacred goal. He is my son. I am his true father. that should decide the question of the guardianship is the Landrecht. And the Landrecht is a court for noblemen only. And at that point, the court asks Ludwig, are you a nobleman? And Ludwig says, yes, of course I am, because my name is Van Beethoven, and the Van is an indication of nobility. In fact, that's not true. The fun is just a part of a typical name from Northern Europe. Von is an indication of nobility in Germany and Austria. Von with an O, not fun with an A, as in Beethoven's name. And so the court says, you are von Beethoven, but you are not a nobleman. My nature shows that I do not belong among this plebeian mass. Since I have raised my nephew into a higher category, neither he nor I belong with the commoner's court. For only innkeepers, cobblers and tailors come under that kind of guardianship. I mean, his life is a series of not getting what he wanted. It starts with not being the high-born personality that he wanted himself to be, and he fabricated quite a lot of a bogus around, around this story. He had a tendency of wanting to be bigger, uh, greater, uh, nobler, bracket, 
narcissistically driven bracket um, um, in all what he did. The Magistrat in Vienna decides to make Johanna von Beethoven co-guardian of her son, Karl von Beethoven Jr. Ludwig von Beethoven doesn't like that decision and he appeals to the next court. The next higher court decides that Ludwig uh, gets guardianship for his nephew, but not the sole guardianship, but co-guardianship with a friend of his. That's the final decision. It's an aspect of, of Beethoven that I don't like to know about, but in a way doesn't surprise me when I think about how he he's kind of reenacting something that he's familiar with. It's the one moment in his life when he thinks everything else is lost to him. He's clearly not going to find a wife. He's clearly going to remain childless. And yet he sees a child left without a father and feels that sense of responsibility that it's his job to raise that child. It was his job to father his brother when their mother died. And so it seems natural for him to want to do that. But the way he goes about it by trying to smash everything around that's been young Carl's infrastructure up until then. I think it's really a brutal trade almost in his inner setup. He wants so much to be somebody different that he doesn't shrink away from making another wife's son his son in order to have at least that, at least a prodigy for himself. You have to be my son, you have to be a musician, you have to follow the line. Grandfather, father, me, the, the utmost genius, and now you. I'm such a genius, I can skip reality and make him my son in a real sense. And that's the program. His composition slows down. He goes into a period of deep reflection. And in the year 1817, he composes nothing at all until the final months of the year. One of the first pieces that he writes, actually, after this long fallow period, is this beautiful song, Resignation. The song Resignation is very easily compared to the entry in his diary about resignation, about resigning yourself to your fate. Resignation, the most sincere resignation to your fate. Only this can make you capable of the sacrifices which your duty and vocation demands. Oh, hard struggle. Thus, in spite of it all, you must win through by defiance. Be absolutely true to your constant conviction. In the song, you have this curious imagery of a light, a candle, that's being snuffed out. But it's a soliloquy and speaking to the candle. Candle, you have to snuff out your light. It's a very, very pessimistic poem, but what Beethoven does with it is incredible because he messes around with the repetitions of the text and the final statement, let out your light. Beethoven is saying here, you have to let loose of what's been holding you back, but this is okay. Let me live, even by means of artificial aids. If only such are to be found. If possible, develop the ear instruments, then travel. This you owe to yourself, to men, and to him, the Almighty.
for the last 10 years of his life, starting in 1818, we have the so-called conversation books, which means that visitors that come to see him write down whatever they want to talk with him about. Because his hearing loss was so hard by the time that he just couldn't understand anymore what they would say. So they had to write down all the things they want, they want to tell him. And the interesting thing about this is that we see how many different people come to see him. And they talk with him about all sorts of things, about politics, what's advertised in town, about music also. They drag terribly. In the aria, I'm following the singer. The overture to Coriolan confused the violoncello. I still remember the problem you had with the timpanist at the rehearsal of Egmont. I think that when constructing a sound machine, one must consult not merely a musician, but a well-grounded physicist, therefore an acoustician. Unfortunately, we don't have his, his answers because he speaks with them. But still, we get a very strong sense of a man who, still in his last years of living, is very much tied to what's on in society. This is one of the restaurants Beethoven frequents regularly, either alone or with friends. We know of that because he writes about it in his conversation books. In his later years, he's 47. Beethoven is always a writer. He's a writer of his own ideas in little books. Advertisement in coffee house in Landstrasse, uh, meals, 60 gulden, celery, 25 gulden, wine, 42 guilders, all together 127, yearly 1524 florins, gulden. So he writes down his income. I think this conversation book showed that even a composer of his standing had to have a daily life and he had to fight for his daily food, meals, and we can see Beethoven here as a guy who suffers from his illness but who still overcomes it with lots of energy. Beethoven says, when he's writing to a publisher, he says, what is difficult is good. And I think he means that on several levels. He means what is difficult for a performer, what is difficult to compose, and what is difficult uh, in one's life in terms of challenges and dealing with sorrow, dealing with suffering. So in 1818, Beethoven has m more freedom. He is getting back into what we call the final period the extraordinary flowering of the late music. So the story of the Diabelli Variations is that, that Diabelli sends out this rather silly waltz that, that he composed to you know, most of the composers of the day, asking them to contribute one variation and he wanted to publish the whole set together. Beethoven, of course, uh, refuses to do that, um, ends up writing 33 variations of his own, and in the process creates perhaps the, the, the greatest piano piece ever written. It takes the best part of an hour to play. There's nowhere it doesn't go. There's nowhere he doesn't take us. And it's the most incredible journey in, in the entire piano repertoire. I mean, how many composers would have thought of turning the accompaniment, the repeated chords, at least the, the top line of those repeated chords, 
into the subject of a fugue as he does in the penultimate variation. So in, in the waltz, you know, you have... So you, and of course the theme in the fugue is... But the, the sheer bloody-mindedness of it, you know, to have this as a theme, I, I can't imagine any other composer doing that. I mean, the, the, the bloody-mindedness of Beethoven isn't to be underestimated. <laughs> For instance, I'm thinking of some of the variations where he leaves you in the most sublime place um, and then completely just, just knocks everything down, you know, just destroys everything. So, so variation 20, which is pretty much the halfway point of, of the set. Um, finishes up like this. complete insanity it's 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 the it's the writing of a madman i mean he's he's not but but you know you you could believe that. <laughs> In 1822, there's a Rossini craze going on in Vienna. Rossini is 30 at this point. He's the hot young voice in opera. He is also an admirer of Beethoven, so he's brought to Beethoven for a visit. Beethoven is 51 at this point. Two things amaze Rossini. One is the squalor that Beethoven is living in, and the other is how warm Beethoven is to him. So in this period, in 1822, when the world considers him half crazy and deaf and finished as a composer, and he hasn't written a symphony in a long time. He is in the middle of the Misa Solemnis, the most ambitious piece of his life. With the Misa, he found a new kind of sacred music that basically was symphonic. The Solemnis is one of the, the two big mass compositions by Beethoven. The fact is that his patron and longtime friend and student, Archduke Rudolf, um, is appointed Archbishop of Olmütz. In January 1819, Beethoven instantly writes to him, The day on which a high mass composed by myself will be performed at the ceremonies for your imperial highness will be the greatest day of my life. Beethoven was convinced that the afterlife is a place you can long for, a piece of rest, a piece of solitude, a piece you don't have to be scared of. So having the occasion to compose a religious work was certainly attached also to the idea that it, he can see it as a very good investment to ensure a place in heaven. My chief aim was to awaken and permanently instill religious feelings not only into the singers but also into the listeners. Uh, 
Currently, Beethoven is convinced that between man on earth and this transcendence figure in, in heaven, there is no connection. So what he does is he composes music that symbolizes God or, or transcendent, and then he does very abrupt cuts, and then there is this earthly music. For example, a wonderful um, sequence is in the glory of the Mrs. Solemnis. Right at the beginning, the text is Gloria in excelsis Deo, and it goes up and up and up. It's this fort and it's rushing up, and, and then it goes up and goes up and goes up, and it, it stops abruptly. And then it's very soft, very low, pianissimo, and it says, et in terra pax, which is peace on earth. And there is really no connection in between. I have the more turned my gaze upwards, but for our own sakes and for others, we are obliged to turn our attention sometimes to lower things. This, too, is a part of human destiny. Around this time, when Beethoven is working on the Misa Solemnus, he feels that he's in bad shape financially. When he finally is close to finishing the Misa Solemnus, he begins to approach publishers with it, and he absolutely promises a row of publishers this piece. And he begins some double dealings and triple and quadruple dealings sometimes. The seemingly vicious way in which Beethoven is selling his Miss Solemnis has damaged his reputation as a composer and as a human being, the problem with Beethoven is that we have to accept that no body has the monopoly of being a sacred man. Being a normal man with, with catastrophes in life, with bad moments, with, with uh, awful behavior, can, in the same time, make the most sublime masterpieces. But in my opinion, it's more than this. What he wants is to get confirmation that this is the best work he ever wrote. Friends of Beethoven, they ask one of the most famous portrait painters of the time, Karl Josef Stieler, to paint a portrait of Beethoven. And Beethoven hates being painted. And Beethoven decides that he wants to have a music manuscript on the portrait, and not any music manuscript, but his most important work, the Missa Solemnis. This is not to present him uh, in the real way he looked, but uh, in the way of genius. So we have this uh, red uh, scarf on his neck, and we have trees in the background. This is a very romantic English way of seeing a, a genius. And we have this look uh, to the sky where, where uh, the genius comes from. He has some split in his personality, in, in his inner feeling, in his way he thinks of himself, a really a split. One side is dealing with the world and doing his art and being a genius and everything, and the other part is not dealing with the reality. I mean, really not dealing. I think this, this brutality and materialistic approach to a, to a human being, like in this uh, long-going story with the nephew, does shed a light on how he deals with people.
As Carl gets older, their relationship deteriorates. They begin basically to drive each other crazy. Carl is, is torn between Beethoven's sometimes smothering affection and episodes of just total neglect. Beethoven hits him, uh, ridicules him, condemns him, and then smothers him. Uh, the letter of September 14th, 1825. This Sunday, you need not come. For with your behavior, we shall never establish true agreement and harmony. Farewell. He who, it is true, did not give you life, but certainly maintained it, and undertook the education of your mind paternally, more than paternally, now implores you to keep to the only true way of goodness and righteousness. Farewell. He simply feels the boy is slipping away from him, slipping out of his control and slipping into what he fears is the immorality and the fundamental evil of his mother, that he's falling into her orbit and becoming her son rather than his. Beethoven writes to Carl. God is my witness. I dream only of one thing, to be entirely rid of you and this wretched brother of mine and this abominable family which has been foisted upon me. May God grant my wishes for never again shall I be capable of suffering on your account. Unfortunately, your father, or rather not your father. The point is that Carl at this point is, is in his late teens. He's a young man. He's behaving like a teenager. He's, he's doing what boys do. Maybe he's drinking too much sometimes. Maybe he's gambling a little bit. He's not a bad kid at all, but Beethoven simply can't handle it because I think it's partly that Beethoven is a man who is used, as an artist, used to having everything absolutely under his control. He has absolute control of the page, and now he wants to have absolute control of Carl because he doesn't understand the independence of other people. This complicated story with the nephew, and his lifestyle, which is so wild and problematic and uh, disgusting in a way. Probably I would run away, be scared of him. As a person, I, I find Beethoven strange and scary and yes, uh, I feel sorry for him. But the music is, is a huge gift to humanity what he did. He gave us a fantastic present. In the spring of 1825, Beethoven is very ill. He's very aware of his mortality, and his doctors recommend that he goes to the spa resort of Baden to recover. He writes this letter to his doctor and invents a little fictional dialogue. Doctor, how are you, patient? Patient, we are not in a good state. Still very weak, belching, etc. My catarrhal condition has the following symptoms here. I cough up rather a lot of blood, probably only from the windpipe, but it does flow out of my nose more often. As far as I know my constitution, I should say my faculties will scarcely recover unaided. In the Thanksgiving movement, we get a sense of Beethoven's insignificance and also the fact that he wishes for a release from his own preoccupations, whether they be the failure of his body or the failure of his relationship with his nephew, Carl. In the sketchbook, he jots down an idea for new strength and that becomes the form for this extraordinary 
slow movement, the Heiliger Dank Gesang. It's very interesting because that's a specific autobiographical link between the, Beethoven's life situation and the music that he writes. I think the late quartets are, they're transcendental. It's really music as a philosophy of life. It's beyond music. This blew me away. And that combined, I, I think especially with the silences in the late quartets, they're so breathtaking and so risky that it, it's just, it's beyond belief. One of the things that's the most moving to me about the late quartets is that here is a guy who's extraordinarily isolated in his own life, his own social life, from his deafness, from his inability really to maintain relationships, creating this ideal series of conversations between four players. So he is creating the circumstances by which we can have wonderful relationships within a string quartet, those very relationships that he himself doesn't have. There's a, a kind of uh, unpleasant irony here that a lot of people have noted that at the same time Beethoven is, is writing this sublime music, uh, he is not doing the potentially sublime job of fathering Carl. He is, is largely ignoring Carl. <laughs> I think reaches the point in, in 1826 where he uh, decides he, he cannot go on in this manner. Something has to change. Carl climbs up to Castle Rauenstein and near where I am standing. It's a, a rather arduous climb. Uh, he clearly had to uh, nerve himself up to making this end. He pulls out a pistol attempts to shoot himself in the head. First time he misses entirely, the second time he, he grazes his skull and inflicts a wound. Most honored Dr. Smetana, a great calamity has occurred, accidentally inflicted by Carl upon himself. There is hope that he may be saved, especially by you, if only you come soon. Carl has a bullet in his head. How you will learn in time. Only hurry. For God's sake, hurry. It's clear Carl is trying to send a distress signal. He, he's not so much trying to kill himself as just trying to indicate, I don't know what else to do with my life right now. This is, this is hopeless. He did certainly succeed in sending that message. Uh, whether Beethoven was capable of receiving it or not is another question. In late September 1826, Beethoven arrives here in Kneixendorf with his nephew, with Karl, for what he thinks will be a short stay. His main purpose is to convince his brother to leave his considerable estate to Karl rather than to uh, his wife, Johann's wife whom Beethoven hates. 
He ends up staying here three months because it also turns out that it's a way for Carl to get away from Vienna where he could be arrested for trying to kill himself and a chance for his wound to heal. And Beethoven simply starts composing at this table in this music room. At this point, his body is falling apart. His world is falling apart. He's losing his nephew by his own ideals. He's fighting with his brother. And here he completes the F minor quartet, his last string quartet, completed Opus 135. Whenever we play the slow movement of this piece, it's, it's on my mind that that's the backdrop to the writing of 135, Beethoven and his relationship with Karl. There's a, a tremendous darkness, particularly in the middle section where time seems to stop and you can really sort of feel Beethoven just in a state of numb shock. Early December, in effect, his rage, his temper, is finally going to prove the end of him. He has another fight with his brother, Johann. He does not really want to be here. He does not really want to deal with his brother and his brother's hated wife at all. He says, I'm leaving. And Johann says, look, the only way you're going to get back to Vienna at this point is an open cart. And Beethoven, in a fury, says, that's what I'll do. And that was the end of him. It was two days travel in the middle of winter in an open cart. And this begins his decline. He's feeling so unwell, he takes to his bed straight away, summons the doctor, and some friends come round. And this is when he r composes his last completed composition. It's a little canon. Um, which says, wie ehren allesamt, nur jeder ehrest anders. And that means we all make mistakes, but everyone makes them quite differently, which is very appropriate, really. I still adhere to the motto, not a day without a line. And if I let the muse sleep, it is only so that she may be all the stronger when she awakes. I hope to give birth to a few more great works, and then to conclude my earthly course among good people like a child grown old in years. Beethoven is in his deathbed, though it takes a long time for death to get him. Carl leaves for the military in January. They have a chilly farewell, and Carl never sees him again. It's, it's all just wretched. The last things that we know of that Beethoven said, he's lying in his deathbed in a coma most of the time. He's asked at some point for Rhine wine, and it was not coming, it was not coming, and finally it arrives that the bottles are sitting on the table next to his bed, and he, he opens up and they say, look, the wine finally, finally came, and he says, pity, too late, and then lapses back into a coma and never wakes up. Just before 6 p.m., March 26, 1827, Beethoven dies. He's been lying there for weeks, turning into a legend and a myth. And that myth and legend, a romantic myth, is overtaking the reality of his life as a man and a musician. The stories about his death are two. One is his brother Johann said he died in my arms. The other is that there was a, a storm raging outside 
And there was a huge clap of thunder, and Beethoven sat bolt upright from his coma, shook his fist at the sky, and sat back dead. That is the ultimate romantic genius death. And who knows, it could even have happened. So when he's finally left us, the autopsy takes place, and it comes as no surprise, really, that his, the insides of his body is pretty much devastated. He suffered from stomach problems throughout his life, and they found that the insides of his ears were just decimated. But the main cause of his death was the cirrhosis of the liver. So the funeral is fixed for the three days later, that's the 29th of March. And an enormous number of people turn out. It was estimated 18,000 people are, are there coming to follow the funeral procession. To have a procession like that, you might expect that for an emperor or a king, but for a commoner like Beethoven, as he was, uh, it's quite extraordinary. So he's really regarded as uh, sort of the equivalent of a king of music. Beethoven is buried like an aristocrat, which he had always claimed to be in a moral and ethical way. The funeral oration is given to Franz Grillparzer, the leading Austrian playwright of his generation, and he wants to capture something for the ages, and in his oration he does. We stand weeping beside the tattered strings of the silent instrument. Art, great sister of both goodness and truth, consoler of the suffering, he held fast to thee. Because he shut himself off from the world, they called him malevolent. And because he avoided sentiment, they called him unfeeling. He withdrew from men after he had given everything and received nothing in return. He was alone because he could find no second self. Parzer, in effect, sends Beethoven off into eternity, bearing the burden of his achievement, bearing the burden of his myth that fuels the 19th century in so many ways and stands as a beacon and a threat and a challenge to everybody who followed him. The contradictions in his life are enfolded in his music in a way that is unique to him that he seems to speak for all of us. And he is speaking for our highs and our lows and our joys and our sorrows and all those sorts of things that art is supposed to do. He does in such a powerful and overwhelming way because he felt it all. And he felt it in his life and he felt it in his work. He's one of the first who has displayed his full life and feelings through his music. Life was not just a straight road from you take your lessons, you go through this, that and the other. His was all over the place, but his humanity came even more to the forefront. And we have seen all sides of a man, a person, a life, in all its brutal honesty.
Beethoven, he comes into a, the Napoleonic age. He has to deal with not only the social disruptions, but also the personal disruptions that come with every life. So he is the bourgeois individual that becomes a genius. And he fits in with everything that is put into that pot of being a genius. Being able to live the genius part of yourself and not to repress it has a high cost. You really make yourself free, but not because you want to, but because you have to. And Beethoven is so fascinating because nobody else did it in such a radical way. December 20th, 1822. My dear Reese, I have been so overburdened with work that I am only now able to reply to your letter. I accept with pleasure the proposal to write a new symphony for the Philharmonic Society of London. For Beethoven, thank God, can write if he can do nothing in the world besides. I remember when I was young, I wanted to change the world. And Beethoven is somebody who managed to change the world. By the Ninth Symphony, Beethoven comes to the point where he needs something more radical, more drastic. He wants the human voice to enter the symphony. Let's singers to suddenly infiltrate the orchestra and turns the, the form of a symphony upside down by, by adding uh, chorus and soloists to it. He actually, with this simple break, throwing away the symphony as a form and entering a simple, almost pop melody as the great moment of a symphony created democracy itself. And this is your melody and all of us take part in the choral symphony. We all jump up and sing. Beethoven is the composer of the human soul. Beethoven is our composer. Yeah.